when you didn't see it all the time. One moral of the story here is just because you're hearing about something, just because you're hearing that something's going on all the time or that there's a new rash or a new epidemic or a new trend of some dangerous phenomenon or social problem doesn't mean there is. It just means that there's some dramatic incidents that the news media and politicians and others can talk about that might have some good film to show with them, some good pictures, some scary stories. The question that has to be asked that each of us has to ask ourselves and that the reporters and politicians should be asking too is, are these isolated incidents or are they trends? From an individual's point of view, that's very important to ask also. There's something that's called the availability heuristic. That's what social psychologists call it. What that's all about is you think that something is very common if you can bring instances of it to your mind. You think something's uncommon if it's hard to bring that mental picture to your mind or to come up with an example. Well, guess what? If you turn on TV news and you hear about whatever it is, school shootings or some new drug that's being used by middle class kids or any of these other kinds of scares that are blown out of proportion, you'll be able to think of incidents, really scary ones. The availability heuristic will really be kicking in and you'll have this impression that it's all around you when it really isn't. When in fact, it's not necessarily even becoming more common. So are we to blame just purely psychologically or is there a, uh, a fear-mongering mechanism or apparatus behind this? I think that it's very tempting to sort of blame the victim or blame the customer you know, or blame the audience. But we've got to be very careful about that. It's certainly true that all of us as customers, as TV viewers and so forth, need to know how to decode these messages we're getting and we need to be responsible ourselves. But it's wrong to blame us. If I turn on my local TV news pretty much any night, anywhere in the United States, I will hear scary stories that make it sound like the community I'm living in is a terrifying, horrible, frightening, risky place, when probably it isn't, or very little of it is, or most of the time it isn't. If I keep watching that, and why shouldn't I? After all, I want to be an informed citizen. Then to say to me that it's my fault that I'm overreacting or getting afraid when that was the whole point of that message, of that medium, I think is putting the blame in the wrong place. If we ask who's responsible for the culture of fear, it's the fear mongers. It's not the people who are receiving the messages. We need to be more careful. Those of us receiving messages don't get completely off the hook, but it's the people who are delivering the messages and intentionally benefiting, profiting off of fear mongering who are really responsible. An analogy I like to give, I'm a college professor. Right? If I taught a course that was called Sex and Violence in Contemporary Teenage Films, and I showed movies with lots of attractive young people with very little clothing on, engaged in provocative and violent activities. If I showed that every class session, I could pack any auditorium on any campus in this country. I could get the biggest enrollment you could ever imagine. And the students would come to class every time and be very attentive. Does that mean that I've done a good job or even done my job? No. And the same thing is true in the media and television news. It's true what producers, directors, reporters say. It's absolutely true. When they do these stories, they get bigger ratings. And the big part of their job is to get and keep an audience. That's true. It doesn't follow from that that the way they do it is an appropriate way to do it, a responsible way to do it, or even that they're doing their jobs. Because their job is to deliver news and to inform the population as part of their responsibility to their advertisers, to their shareholders, and so forth. It's not just to get the audience, just like it's not just my job to have students enroll in this course. If nobody enrolls, I've got a problem. If too few people enroll, I've got a problem. 
but just to get the enrollment isn't the name of the game. Is television worse than the other media? There's a lot of people who benefit and profit off of fear-mongering, but if I had to name the worst culprits, it would clearly be local TV news. Not every station, not every newscast, but by and large, the motto is, as the producers of these shows say themselves, the motto is, if it bleeds, it leads, which means that we're going to start off with and we're going to emphasize frightening, usually violent stories. If we do that, the impression we give then to the audience is that this is common and that this is what our community looks like. So beyond most any other group, they're, they're the main fear mongers. You point, out, um, you point out that there are others who benefit from the culture of fear. Who else benefits? When I go home today, there'll probably be some mail in my mailbox from one advocacy organization or another asking me for a contribution. And it will almost certainly say that if I don't write a check, some horrible thing is going to happen. It might be from an environmental group saying that some horrible environmental thing might happen. It might be from the opposite. It might be from some group that's fighting environmental groups that says I better send a check so that they can fight the horrible things these environmental groups are doing so that my energy prices don't go up. It can be from every side. All political, the whole political spectrum engages in this in trying to raise money for various advocacy groups. So that's a big area where fear-mongering is crucial to fundraising. Marketers of all sorts of products do this all the way from marketers of home alarms, car alarms, uh, carbon monoxide alarms, to realtors who sell homes in gated communities. The list is a long list. Another whole group, uh, um, quite frankly, is class action law lawyers, people, uh, attorneys and law firms that, that file class action lawsuits. Now, I'm not suggesting that some of those, many of those, shouldn't be filed. Those people do very good and important work. But in some cases, it's also very much to their advantage to create a climate of fear so that jurors are more likely to see things their way and companies are more likely to settle claims out of court and pay the plaintiffs large sums of money. One way that class action attorneys do this is to get publicity. One question to ask when you see a news story about some odd kind of danger that, that, that you never even heard of, that they'll normally promote, by the way, very effectively for a whole day in advance, the slightest possibility of major weather storm can be blown up for days on local news stations as the apocalypse is coming. Now, in a way, compared to some of these other risks that are blown out of proportion where whole groups of people, you know, are really treated very badly, young people who are made out to be mass murderers, um, uh, African-American men are often portrayed as, as uh, among, you know, the most dangerous people in the country and so forth. Compared to that, this is pretty innocuous, but not all that innocuous because to the extent that people are scared and stay at home, it hurts businesses and it hurts community life. And for some segments of the population, these kinds of scares and other sorts that we can talk about are really serious business, and that's for elderly people. Many elderly people in this country don't get enough exercise. They don't get out enough. They're afraid to go out. And what's a major reason? Well, they're home alone and they're watching scary stories on TV about things going on. And they're told that elderly people are victimized by crime, that if you walk, you'll be held up. They're told that for months on end that there's another horrible storm that they, they probably can't even survive to, to get to, to the corner and back. So it'd be fair to say that from road rage to 